welcome back to the latest episode of the Master of None podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Murphy, as always. Thanks for joining us. Joined by a special guest and our first golf episode of the series. We have Ronan Malarney joining us. Ronan is a professional golfer from Salt Hill, uh, recently turned professional and quite the illustrious uh, amateur career. So thank you very much, Ronan, for joining us. How are you? No problem. Thanks a minute, Stephen. All good. All good. Good, yeah. So I think we'll, uh, we'll start with your amateur career because you obviously, uh, the tip of your amateur career last year, I would say, was you know, winning the Irish Amateur Close Championship in Bally Bunyan last year. Uh, how was that, obviously? Because you had been said before, you've been kind of pushing for that for a few years. So how was it to finally get over that hurdle? It was great, but it's so long ago now. <laughs> it feels like multiple years ago. Um, and it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Um, a few of the lads came down to watch. Um, I felt like I was playing well. Uh, coming into the week and played well down there. No, I was delighted. I was delighted. And what's it like? Because that's unlike some other competitions where you're playing day in, day out, but it's match play, obviously. Yeah. And in that course, in that conditions, it's not exactly you know an easy 18 holes by any chance. And from your quarter final on, I think the most you won by was what two holes, and then the, the semi final and the final was, it was only one up. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's that like then? Is it tough? Because I'm sure it's exhausting. It's exhausting, but it's. Um... It's, it's kind of believe it or not even in golf there's, there's so much adrenaline when you're playing that you don't feel it but it's the next couple of days when mm. I finished uh, good night that night the night I won but the next couple of days my god I didn't do much um, you really feel it then but um, I suppose I've been playing I, that's actually probably something I may, might have struggled with when I moved from boys golf to playing men's golf is it? it is tiring there's a lot of golf you have to play a lot of concentration um, and even mentally, to be playing the same holes again and again and again, even though you're playing um, someone different. But um, yeah, it, take, it takes a little bit of getting used to, all right. And obviously, with the quarterfinals and the finals being so close, do you feel like your game gets better when it gets to those kind of tight situations? Or how, how do you handle the mental side of that? Because obviously, it's a big competition, you know, you'd love to win obviously six and five every day, yeah. that would be easy. But do, do you enjoy that when it gets tight down to the last couple of holes? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, no, absolutely. It's, it's, it's not easy, but I realized it's so much tougher watching than playing. There's been a few okay. times. Um, I remember one year um, I was in the scholarship in Maynooth and they entered the senior cup team. But, uh, so I couldn't play with Galway. And I went and watched the Galway lads and I, I traveled with them and, Jesus, it is hard. It's really hard to watch. Um, but no, I think one thing I kind of, I, I'd say to myself that is it's, it's kind of why you practice. It's a good thing that you're really nervous. So if I wasn't nervous, there'd be a problem. And I'd say I, def, I would have struggled with that at the start. I suppose most people would have, but you kind of, you, how would you say, you nearly become used to it. Um, the better you play, the more you're, I suppose you're exposed to it. So um, you kind of just learn to play with it. Yeah, because, you know, we all hear the people or the professional golfers say, look at you, you stick to your routine, you try not to think mm. about it. But that's obviously easier said than done. Like, I've, I've, I play golf and I've, in my head, if I'm trying to beat my mate, which, you know, means absolutely nothing, there's no money on the line, there's no title on the line, I get nervous over a tee shot, which is so silly. Because, again, like I said, it's not important. So how do you, when you're coming down the 18th of an incredibly, you know, illustrious amateur tournament, uh, knowing you have to either power, or, you know, or better, how do you, is it a case of just sticking to your routine? Yeah, absolutely. Like, that is true. And you do stick to your team 100%, but you are going to feel different. And I think one of the first things I would, like, I, I kind of really say to myself is, well, firstly, that's normal. And, and secondly, um, like I was saying earlier, it, it's a good thing to feel that way. It means you care. So, um. And like I said, the more you get exposed to it, the easier it becomes. But absolutely, though, like the one thing I would do is I would get so bogged down in what I'm doing. Um, say, for example, if it was a, a second shot, I might say, well, where's the lie? How's it going to come out of this lie? Where's the wind? Where's the pin? Where's the best place to miss? Where's the worst place to miss? Like there's 101 things you can think of. So it's nearly, it's nearly like distracting yourself, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's one thing. But like I said, I, I feel for me personally, the biggest thing was is to put yourself there enough times. It's nearly like, um, not second nature, but it's just, it, it's like everything. Once you get over it, the first time is always the hardest. So, and the more you put yourself there, the easier it becomes, I felt. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
the weather conditions, obviously, Bally Bunyan Club, they're not exactly uh, placid. Um, yeah. how, do you, how do you think your game suits that? Is that something that you've had to work on over your, your career? Obviously, growing up in Galway, you have plenty of ample opportunity to play in windy conditions. So is that something you've always been good at or is it something you actually have had to work on? Yeah, my scores would, would suggest that I'd be, I'd be fairly good in the wind and the poor weather, but like, I know different anyone else. I hate it. It's miserable. Like even today I was playing and it was freezing. Now it wasn't too bad windy wise, but like I, I suppose it'd be good for hanging in there, but no one enjoys it. And if they say they do, they're lying. No one enjoys playing in that. Um, but yeah, I can, I've always worked on flight and the ball, um, lower, mid, and then as I've, as I've played different courses, flight and slightly higher, which is a pro- shot that probably wouldn't come as naturally to me as maybe the lower shots. So, um, yeah, I suppose my game probably would suit that, but there's no, there's no trick to it. I suppose there is a bit of practice that you need to do to put in to get used to playing the bad weather, but yeah, it's it's, it's not pretty. Yeah, well, at least you, definitely in Galway, you, recently as well, you've had plenty of opportunity to get used to it. Um, <laughs> you, turned, uh, you turned professional after that win, obviously, but you debated turning pro for a while over the last couple of years, haven't you, Ronan? Yeah, so like if, if you would have asked me any time, probably since I was about... 15 or 16 I would have loved to turn pro um but I didn't want to turn pro unless I could see not necessarily that I'd be good enough right now but I could be good enough so that I was constantly making strides I was constantly moving up through the the ladder I suppose of golf be it amateur and then pro um and I felt that that was probably a good time there's also a bit of as I worked now, as it worked out be with COVID and all this, probably not really, but I, when the iron's hot strike, that type of thing, I felt I was playing quite well. Um, and also there's, there's obviously the other side of it to get um, uh, sponsorship in place. And you know, there's, there's, there's kind of another side to it that people who purely think of golf, they don't quite see. So um, there's a few things. You kind of have to get your ducks in a row before I decide to turn pro. And do you, st- you mentioned that uh, the, the business side of things, sort of, is, mm. is that something that you have handled well or is it something that you do, you do you let that side of things go to someone else or is that something that you actually handle yourself well I'm actually quite lucky I was never great in school but the one thing I did kind of like was business and then I did an undergraduate and a master's effectively in business studies and um, so I can to get sponsorship I was lucky enough I got um Davy Stockbrokers, Carboyle, Newt University and then Team Ireland um, with the GUI so I did out my own business plan so I had a lot of things like that kind of um in order when i was going to look for sponsorship so i i don't know i it definitely didn't hurt so um no i kind of get a little bit hands-on in relation to things like that i like to know um where i am um be it financially or otherwise and i kind of have a plan in place that type of thing so i'm, I'm okay that way very good. Well, when did you? I've often wondered about this professional golfers. When did you know that you were really good at this game? Because, <laughs> like, at what, at what I age? Still don't know. Like, I don't yes. know. <laughs> but like, at what age do you start being like, okay, I could actually do this for a living? Because, you know, a lot of I've I played I played with low handicap golfers. You know, up to from scratch up to four. But professional is just a different level still from that. So you mm-hmm. know, when did you? When did it kick in that actually this was something you could do for a living? Um, it's a good question. I don't think it ever, it's not kind of like penny drops, that type of moment, or it wasn't for me anyway. Um, and it's like, there's, there's nothing but self-doubt. So you'd be playing really well for one week and you're like, yeah, no, I can, I can definitely make money doing this game. And the next week you miss the cut and you're like, oh God. So it's, it's like, it's a constant up and down roller coaster type of situation. Or it is for me anyway. So um, the main thing is to be fairly level headed and to, and it's hard, but not be, not live and breathe on every miscut or make cut to be one thing I started doing slightly better. And I was taking statistics and looking at them and just, it's nearly like affirmation that you're moving in the right direction. So there definitely wasn't one moment where I thought, Oh, I'm, I'm definitely good enough. But, um, yeah, I just like to see that I'm, I'm constantly making progression. I can see that there's more room for more progression within the capabilities I have, I suppose. Yeah. You touched on your college uh, already. You obviously went to Minute uh, University. Mm. Was that somewhere, was Minute your, your first choice? Was that someone that they reached out to you or was that, is that where you wanted to go? Yeah, so I got, um, 
I took one year out after school because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I went over to Quinta Lago in Portugal and with a friend of mine from the, from, uh, the golf club. And we did a little bit of work experience over there and we got used to the course. That was brilliant. Um, just to, I want to be sure I was making the right decision because obviously the next step was going to be a big one. And I got a um, good offer to go to the States, but it's kind of hard to work. I just didn't really feel like I was quite ready to, to go um, for whatever reason that was. And I have to say, I was delighted I went to Manit. Um, I loved that there was a big influx of, of lads my own age and slightly older going in there. So the standard went, it was already quite good when we were there, but the amount of guys that came in, it was, it was really competitive. Um, and Barry Fenley's running up there and it still is brilliant. I'm obviously still tied to them now. Um, but no, I'd say, I'd honestly say that's one of the best decisions I've made. And I was only thinking about it there not too long ago. So I was really happy I made that choice. That's good. We'll touch on the American offer in a second, but yeah. what's, what's your college life compared to, say, like someone like me? Because obviously I'm out. If I was, when I was in college, you're out two nights a week. You're out three nights a week. <laughs> you're, not, you're not focusing on uh, you know, being an elite athlete at a sport. So what is your day-to-day like when you're in Manute College? Do you still have that opportunity to be a normal 19-year-old? Or is yeah, there obviously a bit of like, you know, I have to go you know, hit some shots in the morning. I don't want to be looking. I don't want to see two golf balls instead of one. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, the one thing that I did really like about Manute was... Um, and again, I, I, well, I didn't go to the States, but I talked to a lot of people who did. And it just seemed to me a little bit, and again, I could be wrong, guys might tell me otherwise, that it was kind of all about the scores. And my great golf is all about the scores. But in Manute, there was kind of, they wanted to make sure you were, you kind of, um, how could I put this? You left a better player than the way you came. I definitely feel I did. But um, so there was kind of nearly like a holistic type of approach. So there was psychology and there was gym and there was yoga. And then obviously there was the coach and things like that and things like psychology and gym. I, I never would have done much before I went to Manute. So that was kind of an eye opener, even yoga. So I um, would have played a bit of sport, but never in relation to golf or the actual gym itself. So um, that was a bit of an eye opener. Um, but the average day, I know, absolutely. Like it's in Manute, there's certain things that you, you have to apply yourself to in regards to the scholarship. So we might have coaching um twice a week we might have one competitive match once a week on a friday before we we go home for the weekend or before the lads would leave um a psychology and a yoga session they might be stamp they might be kind of set in stone you have to be there for that and then after that it, it's up to yourself but like it, it, if you're not putting in the work it shows and then you don't get picked in the teams and you're watching the lads leaving the airport while you're sitting there taking an exam or something so it's it's up to yourself but um i suppose that was quite a good minute because a lot of the lads were kind of competitive so you'd have your own games or you could do your own practice i was i like my practice so that was never really an issue for me um it's such a treat to be up there in carton i've actually missed it since i've come home so um yeah i I would have put in a good few hours but never would have felt like an effort or anything i just i really like to do it so um but absolutely of course we go out every so often um yeah, no, it was a good mix up there, I thought. You touched on that point there about American college, we know about the scores, and again, we'll talk about that next, but is that just because, look, at the, the amount of people that are trying to get into those spots in American colleges is just so much Absolutely. larger than the Irish colleges. They can't really be, not picky is not the right word, but you know what I mean, as in like the, the Americans are trying to get the best of the best, whereas they might be like, this is great, we're just getting lads in sort of thing. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. I would still say there's there's a really high standard in Minute. Um but no, absolutely. Like there's uh, the way I might word it is there's there's one Minute in Ireland where um say of that standard of golfer there might be I couldn't tell you maybe 50 in America. So they obviously they have to be very picky. And absolutely and golf is a game of score. I completely get that. But um I just felt and I could have even been the people I've talked to that they were just, it was just so hell bent on score that if your swing was slightly off or anything, it just like it didn't matter, just all about the score. And that part of that is professional golf, so I completely understand it. But um, just for me, maybe at the time, I would say Minute was the right choice. Yeah, exactly. That's, a, that's much, uh, much better way of saying it than I did. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll talk about that offer, obviously, because yeah, it was from North Carolina, was it? Sorry. Yeah, how'd you yeah. know that? <laughs> Do, I do a little bit of research on this podcast, not <laughs> too much. Uh, North Carolina came in, obviously, with the offer. Um, yeah. 
you obviously you, you you sound like you're very at peace with the decision. You're you're happy you went to Minute instead. Mm. What what was it your personal decision? Obviously, did you include you know your family in it, or was it down to what you wanted? Like, how long did you spend making that decision? Yeah, well, that was the time in Portugal. I would have spent. I was actually over there with a guy who had got an offer from the states and was going. So I got bounced a few ideas off him and how he felt about it and things like that. So, um, it definitely wasn't made in a week, in a day, in a month. It took it took a long time, um, and that was obviously partly why I took the year out. So, um, yeah, no, I I am a peace decision. I think that there'd probably be an issue if I wasn't. So, um, yeah, I, I obviously be very interested to see if I if I went the other way, if I went over the states, how it would all turn out. But um, yeah, no, it was a decision you have to take over a long time. Like it's you're committing to a long time. I I'm almost positive if I went, I definitely wouldn't be coming back. I mean, that's easy to say that. But I think I just would have even been stubborn enough, even if I didn't like it, to stay there. So, um, yeah, no, I am. I'm happy with the decision went. You'd probably have more of a tan if you had a went. Have you seen my nope. hair? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. I think North Carolina's supposed to be pretty nice. So you probably would have, man. You probably would have. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but, yeah, no, it's a, I respect the decision because I think a lot of people would have been like, you know, um, the American colleges have such prestige among, you know, golf yeah. and the, the golfing. Uh, the university, the competition over there is incredible. But at the same time, yeah, look, Manute's a beautiful place too, so fair play. Um, you still, though, uh, you got to represent the international team in the Arnold Palmer Cup mm. in 2018, I think it was, um, which if anyone isn't aware of the competition, basically it's America against the rest of the world. Uh, men and women joined from all different colleges, obviously, and team up. But you were on a team that included Victor Hovland, and then mm. you were up against the USA team, which had Colin Morikawa, obviously the 2020 US PGA champion, and Matthew Wolf, who is, you know, uh, a great golfer and has contended uh, recently as well. What's that like coming up? Obviously, at the time, you don't know who them lads are nearly as much as they are now. But what was that experience like playing at that elite level of college golf? Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. That was like that was like a taste of American golf, I suppose. Albeit it was in. France or Switzerland, I mean. Um, yeah, that was amazing. Um, I didn't, there was actually so many on that team. There was 12 men, 12 women on either side. So 48 participants. So like a few of the lads now would ask me, oh, how did Victor, how did Matthew hit it or Colin? And, and I'd say, I, I watched Matthew hit a few balls just as I was passing. I was hitting a few chips and he was, he was clipping a few balls. And he struck the ball really well. It, it, it made like a different sound when he hit it. Um, I saw Victor hit a couple of balls. Matt, I didn't see Colin at all. Um, but no, it's brilliant. It's brilliant to uh, pitch yourself against these guys. Just, just where do you rank? Where, where are they better? Where am I better? Where can I improve? Um, how do they go about things? I'll be playing with any golfer who might be better or even worse. You can pick up something. But no, absolutely. Brilliant playing with those guys. And, uh, I got to know Victor a little bit. He was really, really nice guy. Um, so yeah, fair play to him. Class. Did, did Matthew Wolf have the same swing as he does now? With uh, you know, it looks yeah, yeah. obviously insane, but yeah. it obviously produces the results. Like what? I'm sure that was the first time you'd seen a swing like that, especially at that level. So what? What's going through your head when you stumble upon that? Are you like, is this lad taking the piss, or is he actually? <laughs> well, like me and Dad would talk about it all the time. Like, like it's you can take it back any way you want, but through the ball, it's. He's as good as anyone, clearly, because of the results he's producing. So um, I would nearly say for him it's an advantage because I would say to market him is a dream. So easy He's, to be unique like that. So um, absolutely, it, it wouldn't be textbook, far from it, but um, he's not the first. Jimmy Brown saw something like that too. So um, yeah, he absolutely rips the ball. I think Jim Fiorix won about $150 million swing on the golf club. So, yeah, yeah. it's, it's not the worst, definitely. Yeah. Um, but the, seeing, obviously, them boys progressing how they have done, does that give you mm. incredible belief? Because, obviously, that week, you had a mixed bag. You obviously you won one, I think, and you lost a few, but you're still at that level. So, like, when you see Colin Marikawa going on to win a USPGA, does that just in, inspire you and give you that belief that that can be you? Um, yeah. I am, to be honest, yeah, it's a good point. I, it's something I haven't really thought of. I'm kind of, um, I'm nearly so engrossed in what I'm at that I don't necessarily compare myself to anyone else because, you know, they might be in a slightly different stage to me, um, if, although I love to be the stage they're at now. Um, but, yeah, I suppose I suppose it does. Um, I can't say, like I said, I've, I've honestly looked at it that way, but um, absolutely, and, and again, 
I know I was somewhere close to their level at that time, but I, I didn't actually play against the guys. So I didn't really see them up close, compete against them and, and see exactly what they're like. But um, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I suppose I could definitely look at it that way. And obviously, just the last thing on this, everyone looks mm-hmm. at the Ryder Cup and the players always say, you know, it's the best thing. Team golf is just the best mm. form of golf. Is there that similar bond when you're on the team like that? Obviously, as you said, there's way more people there and you're not necessarily as connected as maybe the, the lads on the, the Ryder Cup are. But is there a team bond? Like, Was it incredibly fun to play as a team? Yeah, that was that was the that was the best thing I've ever played. In. That was incredible. Um, that, that was an unbelievable experience. And yeah, surprisingly, like I would have never met 90% of them, maybe more. Um, I knew Olivia and Chloe going over, two Irish girls. And I would have heard of a few of the other guys. I would have known their names, but I didn't know them from, from Adam. Like, And they were just really, really good guys. Still keep in contact with a lot of them on, on Snapchat or Messenger or anything, uh, different things like that. So a lot of really, really good people. Um, so yeah, no, it's brilliant. Brilliant, great week. Uh, was the USA chants annoying as they are on TV? <laughs> yeah. Well, there wasn't too many. There wasn't too many. The crowds weren't that big. There was no yeah, ropes yeah. or anything. <laughs> People looking for my autograph. Far from yeah. but, um, it wasn't Le Golf National, no? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No, no, no. I have to say, though, when a few of them had face paint on of USA, that kind of got me slightly more interested if I needed to be any more interested. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm only teasing uh, the American. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to get on to your dad, who's obviously been an incredible, uh, important piece of your life. He's your coach. He, he got you into golf and all that. But what's that relationship like? Because a professional golfer and a coach, you know, sometimes I'm sure it can be a, a, an awkward relationship if, you know, if you're not happy with what they're doing and vice versa. But then obviously in your situation, he's your father. So what is that relationship like having your dad as your coach? Like I, I could sit here and give you a really fluffy answer and say, it's so good. It's so handy. It is a massive pain. <laughs> There's just no two ways about it. It's a massive pain. Although he's good at what he does and he's helped me no end, it is endlessly frustrating. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> but it is a massive help all the same. So there's a lot of tongue biting I have to do and stress ball work, you could say. But um, no, it, it is good. So like even a lot of people now would ask me like, so do you go for a lesson with your dad? And it's not like, dad, what are you doing at 12 o'clock? Can I have an hour of your time? It's, we'll go play nine holes and then we might do a little bit of practice afterwards and he might say, well, you notice, you know, when it's slightly off the left, you're, you're missing more off to the left and the right or just something like that. And, and obviously I can't look at myself when I'm swinging. So he would see things that I would be doing that I wouldn't even know I'd be doing because it's second nature. Um, so he'd always be, he'd always just be making sure I, I kind of, I know what I'm at. So I'm checking things regularly um, and just different things like that. And again, he would have seen me since I first won the club to now. So there's lots of things that he would see and trends I go on and, and everything. All majority of good golfers will tell you, like it's the same issues that keep occurring again and again. You fall into the same little ruts all the time. So it's just keeping a constant eye on these different small little things. Yeah, but as, as she said, like, you know, it's already taking criticism from someone. But then when it's your father, you're always kind of like, you know, as a kid growing up, you're like, shut up, dad. You know, you don't know yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Your dad always thinks he's a better driver or a better golfer, I'm sure, than you are, which, you know, he obviously probably isn't. But um, is, <laughs> is that... Tell him that, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> is that frustrating when it's your... Not just... Uh, a, like, there's no, there's no two ways about it. If it was... I, like, I would much prefer to be taking criticism from you. Or from anyone, really, if you're honest. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not that easy. And it's not like you can separate him for three hours a day and say, he's not dad for these three hours. He's, he's coaching me. Because it just doesn't work like that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not that easy. But he would definitely pick up on things easier than, say, if I, if I went to someone else. There's, like, there's no two ways about it even. Even certain times under pressure, he might stay. He he, he might find things because he could he can really like match my personality to how I'm playing. Am I am I slightly worse? Or am I slightly better under pressure? Have I improved that over time? Different things like that. So there's lots of facets where it's just it is a big advantage. Yeah, hundred percent. And he he had a great quote that I, I think is 
It's very smart and it obviously applies to you, but he was saying that, you know, when you're 25 years old, you don't call your maths teacher and ask what eight times eight is. You know, they've taught <laughs> you that and gave you the knowledge to know that how to work out yourself. So it seems like he, what he's basically saying there, obviously, with your swing is, you know yourself sort of when something's going wrong, what you should work on. And is that something that you can, can you, if you have, say, say you're missing the ball to the right more than you should be, do you know in the back of your head what it probably is? Yeah, so like I said, there's these certain um, ruts you'd always fall into, and that's I say that's 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 one of the best sayings I've heard. I I really like that one too. I have to say, so um, absolutely, and I would say that's how he would have taught me, and that's how I've st- kind of tried to continue on. Um, that's not to say I'd know everything about the golf thing. Absolutely far from it, but I'd know a lot about my own thing, um, and I think that's. A lot more important because I I don't necessarily want to teach. I want to play. So, um, yeah, no, that that's the way I've I've always kind of tried to go about things. Is is the more I know, the better. Your dad was the first certified instructor of the golf machine. So, yeah. if, uh, can you give us a brief synopsis of what that is? Just <laughs> no, that's not possible. There's no brief synopsis of that. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Just for people listening at home, because I'm not um, sure myself, if I'm honest. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Well, I would say Bryson has made the golf machine kind of fashionable at the moment. Um, the golf machine is... Now, that is a good question. How would I put this um, in a very small sentence? Um the golf machine is basically, it's, it's golf. It's a scientific version of, of the golf thing. So there's nothing, there's nothing all that easy about it. If there isn't, there isn't all that many color pictures. It's not an easy read, but it's factually and scientifically on the money. Um, and this book was made long before Trackman. And even with Trackman coming out, everything that's in that book has been proven by Trackman to be correct. A few people argue that, argue back. But it is uh, it is good, and it's it's. I've read parts of it. I should read more of it. Again, I'm so kind of focused on my own stuff that I know that book can help me. But that's more. It's more all the variations of the game. So it's um, yeah, it's it's some book. I can only imagine the time Homer Kelly spent on on writing that book. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, and you you touched on Bryson DeChambeau obviously because he has studied it. That was my next question. Obviously, Bryson DeChambeau is probably the most polarizing player that we've ever had in golf uh, yeah. at the moment. Um, what's your opinion on him? Because people obviously it seems to be either your former or against him. And uh, what's your thoughts on him? He's, like, he's, he's incredible. Um, I I would say he doesn't help himself with some of the things he says. Being honest, I don't think he cares. Um, which is which is fair enough too. Um, but the work he puts in, like he's completely devoted himself to golf, which is incredible because I, I don't know if I could think of anyone else who has, I Tiger, I would say has for the large majority. Um, but Bryson, like, like if just take out the golf stuff alone, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I know very little about the gym and things like that, but I wouldn't know to put on that size and keep that size would take ferocious work. Um, and that's on top of all his golf stuff. So he's like, he's just a workhorse for golf. Um, and fair play to him. Um, I, I am interested to see in the, lo- in the long term how all this um, pounding of balls works out. Um, not to say it won't work out well, but um, he could have 10 or 12 majors before if it doesn't, if anything bad is going to happen, if it does happen. Um, so it might be well worth it. But um, it's interesting. Like he's, he, he says he's, he's doing it so that he can prove to people there's multiple ways to play the game and make it easier for others and fair play to him. I totally agree. I have to say, like, I agree with your sense that, yeah, he doesn't help himself sometimes, but look, mm. as someone who enjoys the, you know, the, the interview side of sports, I love yeah. that when athletes are honest, I yeah, think I, I'm a massive Roy McRae fan. And again, he's gotten himself into trouble sometimes just because yeah. he genuinely says what's on his mind uh, sometimes. Mm-hmm. And that might be stupid because, you know, PR is obviously a massive part of it. But as you said before, he's changing the way people look at golf. And golf is one of those sports that needs to be uh, shaken up sometimes. Absolutely. And he Absolutely. is that. But have you, so has the long distance bug bit you? Are you, are you trying to yeah. up your swing speeds? I, it, it's always bitten me. It's bitten me oh, okay. probably since I was about an 18. So you're always trying to hit it slightly further. But um, I'm never going to hit it Bryce and Long. So if I just concentrate on lashing it hard, I'm going to lose ground on everyone else from where I am at present. So, um, definitely always trying to work on getting a bit longer constantly was just doing it there before we talked 
Um, but that's not... I will never be able to get the advantage Bryson will by pure length. So I will always... Actually, is always number one for me. Um, but it is pretty cool to watch him. He's box office. And what do you, what do, you do for swing speed then? Is it, is it, is it some simple drills? Uh, or are you in the gym a lot? Yes, in the, in the gym a little bit. Um, I have to start going back more since they've opened. Um, but like one guy put it really well to me because, and I know there is a correlation, but he, he said to me one day, he was like, uh, if you go in to do box jumps and you continue to do box jumps, um, he goes, what are, you, what are you improving? And I was like, well, if I can get my legs stronger, I can have a stable, more stable race, I can create more power. And he goes, yeah but really you're getting better at box jumps. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, okay, that's fair enough. <laughs> that's fair enough. Although there is a correlation, but um, I got his point. So I try to do, absolutely, you need to do stuff. You need to get stronger and faster and quicker. But um, even just there this evening, 20 balls, just lashing out hard. And obviously within reason, I'm not falling over and not going to hurt myself and things like that. But um, speed sticks to a point. Um, Again, the, the reason I be I say to a point with the speed six is because if you start lashing at it, what you'll gain distance-wise, you'll lose in score because you'll just be spraying all over the place. So you have to do it somewhat within a golf swing. Um, but yeah, swinging heavy clubs, fast clubs, um, higher hands, the top of your swing, swinging fans. Um, yeah, there's a whole range of different things you can do. Yeah, it's fascinating that that's the obsession with it now and it's... Mm. Look, I think as I said, as I said before, I think change is always good in golf. But it is well, fascinating to watch Bryson um, and how he, he does. Uh, it does continue on. He's obviously got one major, so who's to say he won't have any more? Yeah. Um, another aspect I want to okay. uh, touch on, Ron, is you're incredibly mature and thoughtful for your age because you're only 24. <laughs> Who told you that? Well, no, I but can you tell can... you a few people now won't <laughs> agree with that. But the way you can tell him with the way your response and the way you think about things, it's incredible. Like in golf, it's, it can be good and it can be bad to be thoughtful because obviously you can get into your own head too much. Yeah. Or, you know, everyone says about Dustin Johnson, the best part of him is he doesn't think too much. Mm. Uh, and it does help. But where does this come from? Is this from your dad? Is it from your parents? Is it from your upbringing? And where does this calmness come from? Mm, the calmness definitely isn't from that. I promise you that. And um, the thinking side might be from that. I say yeah. thinking side is from that. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I would say, in my own opinion, probably I can. It, the way I don't know—is it kind of talent? I don't really like to use that word. It might be talent, but the way DJ can, Dustin Johnson, he can go out and and kind of have his head in the air to a point. He's definitely, definitely a lot smarter than people think he is. A lot smarter, especially golf smarts. But um, I, I don't feel, uh, be it distance-wise or talent-wise or whatever that is, that I can necessarily just go out there, head in the clouds, uh, clip a few balls in the evening, hit a few putts, and I'll be good to go. I need to look into it a bit more than that um, to get my advantage or to be as good as I feel like I, I want to be. So... Um, I try and make sure I leave no stone unturned, even though there's, there's obviously things I can't stand doing. But if I know I'm going to make them better, I, I try my best to get them done. Um, so yeah, I've always tried to make sure I'm, I'm thinking through things. And um, I think dad's given me a good baseline in that. He won't always be there, won't always be around, so that I have kind of a good way I kind of like start business. It's like a sieve. You get so much information from so many different people, so many perspectives that I have um, kind of a base on what works for me, what always has worked. And I can go back to that when things go wrong. Yeah, exactly. And you, uh, the, another reason why I think you're very tough, like you've said several times now in different articles I've read about you, that you're quite comfortable with the idea of like, look, I'm trying to decide if it works great. If it doesn't, then that's okay too. Do you know what I mean? You, your goal is to obviously try your best to be as good as golfer as you can. And once, you're, once you keep seeing signs of you improving, then that's great. But you also seem quite comfortable. Like, look, this is a... I think you've also said golf is quite a fickle sport. Um, mm -hmm. is, is that, again, is that something that your parents have kind of put into you or is that just something that you've noticed at looking at the golfing world? Uh, well, I, well, I've definitely noticed golf, golf's fickle in that. Like, you, you can see it in yourself or you can see it in, say, Rory, for example, Rory McIlroy. How good was he before the lockdown and the lockdown comes and... He's not quite top here, even though 
He's still incredibly good. Top tens aren't good in most people's books for Rory, but um, it is. That's just the way it is. It's like you need two shots in the same area, one bounces left, one bounces right, ten feet for one, plugged in a bunker for the other. So, um, that's that's just the way it is. And although I might speak a good game that way, it is awful hard to do it. Like it's just not easy. Um, so there is kind of a, a lot of maybe getting out of your own way, but um, yeah. If I could maybe do as well as I preach, I might be doing a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all good at giving advice and then taking yeah. it different. Uh, another point you made, which I, I loved, was you know the post-mortem after a bad round. You mm. basically said, like, that's something that you have to do yourself at the start before you bring in sort of other opinions. Mm-hmm. Um, because golf is so singular, it's not a team sport 95% of the time. Obviously, there is a few mm-hmm. events, but... It's not like football where it's team effort and it's more you can sort of look at as a team. It's all it, golf is so personal. Yeah. What's that like? Because it, it has to be tough, obviously, especially if it's a, a you know a particularly bad round and you know when you're in the when you're in contention or something like that. Yeah. How how long does it take? What's what do you like to do? Do you just like to lock yourself away in a room? Like what what is that process after a bad round like? And then when do you start bringing in people like your dad? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Well, I gave you a good example is after the Irish Amateur last year. Um, I shot terrible last year. I was in the final group. Um, I wasn't going to bring it up, Ronan. Yeah. I did see it. I, I did see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's the first one I thought of when you when you talk post mortem. Um, yeah, it's not easy. Like I would. Again, I could give you like the politically correct answer, like, but you know, this is just no point. I was like. It was in terrible form after that, as I'm sure a few people will tell you. Um, even though I managed to put a, a decent brave face on it for a couple of hours anyway for the prize given. But um, yeah, it, it's not easy. It's not easy. I like I, I pretty much I would. I would lock myself away in a room and I'd like to be for the first maybe day, I just I block it out. I don't even want to think about it, I have enough of it. Because I'm just after living it for the previous six hours. So um but after that you have to break it down and see why did it go wrong? Where did it go wrong? Is there anything that led up to it to encourage that outcome? Uh, what would I do better? Where are my misses? How did, it, how did I kind of control things? Because I would say, I'd be comfortable enough in saying that if I was going out playing with the lads, I wouldn't have shot that score. So obviously the, the pressure had something to do with it. Why did that have something to do with it? Where did it go when I felt most nervous? Where did I feel most nervous? Like there's a hundred one ways you can look at it. So instead of, someone coming in now dad dad wouldn't do this but say i asked dad straight away and he was like yeah Roman, well on seven you came slightly over the top well, yeah i did come slightly over the top but why did i come slightly over the top there's a reason for that i must have maybe there's a big fear of going right so um everything is like cause and effect everything so it's not as simple as like in that in that situation i would find on its own that would be useless stats wise or when you only hit nine greens shot six over you three three puts like there there's the reason all right that is the reason but why is that so um that's why i always like to make to make sure that i um i understand to the best of my knowledge why things happened and then i can go about fixing them yeah exactly it's I could listen to people talk about this all day because it's so fascinating. But uh, the last, the last thing I, um, when it comes to you, like the thoughtfulness and the way you think, because I do find that fascinating. Uh, professional golfers' minds. You said, you know, growing up. I think most people who play golf from a young age, growing up, when you're playing and when you're young, you're you're a bit fearless. You're, you know, you're as you said, you were addicted to golf and you you loved it and it was so much fun. But nowadays, it's still fun, but it's obviously more serious. Mm-hmm. Is there a way for you to try and find that mindset of being a kid out on the golf course when competing, or is it is it impossible at this stage? You know, when is it possible to block out all the the seriousness, basically? Mm, that's a good question. I would say I definitely knock as much fun out of golf. That's actually something COVID taught me. I'll get back to that. Sorry. Um, I would knock as much fun out of golf now, more fun out of golf now than I did when I was a child. I would say. Um, I've always loved competing, be it anything, doesn't really matter what it is. So that was always helpful as I got better. Um, yeah, I, 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 when, when I say, because I, I often, I kind of fear people picking that up wrong if I was ever talking to anyone about this. I, I treated 
golf like a job. The word job sounds quite negative. Nothing negative about it. I just mean that the only negative I would say is like, say for example, I like to do a little bit of running, but in regards to going to the gym, I don't really like it all that much. But I know to get slightly better, I should do X amount of gym work. So in that way, I treat it like a job. Whereas if I didn't treat it like a job, I'd be like, no, nah, I don't care. I'll just go chipping or putting or I'll just go play with the lads. And that's what I mean by that. And because I think there's the, there's the, there's the best way to do something to get the, the best results. And that might be the nice way or the easy way. It's generally not. So I try and, and, and that's where part of that like reflection and thinking about things comes from um, to plan around that. And no, I definitely, I definitely don't really feel that's an issue. I would have always said just on that point I mentioned there about what COVID taught me was I would have always said to people that I don't, I don't really love golf, but I would say I'm addicted. So what I mean by that is um, I'm sure there's, there's lots of people out there that are addicted to things that aren't good for them. And really no real addiction is all that good for you. But um, I, like, I, I, I think I'd be a bit lost without it, that type of way. But I realized over the lockdown that, no, I really do like it. <laughs> um, so it's a bit of both, a bit of a love and an addiction. So, um, yeah, no, I think, I think I'm okay that way so far anyway. Maybe if we're talking in two or three years' time, I might have a different answer. Yeah, it's definitely better than working in an office, you know, nine to five. I tell you, there's certain times you might wonder, but I, <laughs> yeah, I, I understand yeah. what you're saying. The office is warm, whereas yeah, out in the golf course, it's warm, freezing. Yeah. Yeah, you can't uh, sleep up in the office. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I probably could. Uh, <laughs> well, what's coming up next for you, Ron? What's what is your schedule like for the next couple of months? Because obviously, not the as we say, COVID, not mm. the, not normal times. What's your golfing schedule like with events and whatnot? So I've pulled card on the european uh, europe pro tour next year so i will play that from may to october um, and then hopefully i haven't kind of a finalized yet but I'm, I'm trying to get away to do a bit of practice for a couple of months from january february um, and a few smaller competitions and then team ireland are very good to us they get us um hopefully they did this year anyway obviously covid put bit to that but a few invites to the challenge tour which would be the next step up uh, we get a few invites for them, so hopefully I'll get a few of them to start the year, and then I can play the the year on the Europro. Nice. And what do you set goals for yourself? Say two or three years down the line, where do you like to see yourself, or is it uh, just take every event as they come? Yeah, that's one thing. I'm I'm working with a psychologist, um, Anne Marie Kenny from Maynooth. She was in Maynooth, so I can change to do a work with her, and I have a phone call coming up with her to to set a few goals. It's never. I would be good at setting kind of like I want to make I want to make sure I have a win this year or I want to finish top five. But there's there's kind of more important goals and, and more specific goals than that that um, would equate to those bigger goals that I could probably def- get it a lot better at. So um, I suppose if we had this maybe a week later, I could tell you, but I haven't had it done yet. So um, I'll know next week. Yeah, we'll, we'll check back in next week, Ronan, just to get the updates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ronan, look, I really enjoyed this. Thank you very much for uh, giving us the half hour or so out of your time. Uh, looking forward to following you over the next couple of months uh, and seeing how you get on and wishing you nothing but success. So, Ronan, appreciate your time and we'll do it again sometime. Perfect. Thanks a million. Thanks for everything. Cheers.